Thank you for coming to today's uh, CITP Lunchtime Seminar. We are very privileged today to have Philippa Gill, who will be talking about politically motivated adversaries. Um, Philippa is an assistant professor in the Computer Science Department at Stony Brook. She's been there since uh, 2012, since uh, she received her PhD at the University of Toronto. Uh, before that, she was at the University of Calgary. And uh, her work focuses on um, many aspects of computer networking particularly on um, network security and internet measurement. She's probably one of the, um, the, the world's leading experts on internet measurement and has done a lot of work on that ranging from security to social networks. Um, more recently, she is leading a project called IC Lab uh, out of Stony Brook uh, that uh, I guess stands for a variety of things, um, but it involves uh, measurement of internet censorship and interference on a, on a fairly broad scale. So today she'll be talking about targeted threats and fingerprinting of censorship products. Okay. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. So today I'm talking about some work that's been going on in my lab at Stony Brook, looking at sort of politically motivated adversaries. And I'm going to focus in on two uh, projects that we've done in this area, looking at, you know, when you have these politically motivated adversaries, you know, how is this different from, say, traditional security? So, um, you know, one of the trends we see here is that with politically motivated adversaries, we shift sort of the economic model of security, right? You can think of, you know, your traditional spammer or adversary that you learn about in your computer security class who's, you know, he's sending out a ton of ads for fake Rolexes and he's hoping, you know, one or two people will click the link, enter their credit card info, and he gets some money. In contrast, these politically motivated actors, they're not financially motivated. What they're motivated by is actually controlling access to information and getting access to information about you know, different political groups and things that are going on. And so because of this, these politically motivated actors are willing to invest significant resources. So they're willing to put in a lot of time and money in order to achieve their goals. So part of the um, outputs of this has been the creation of a large market for censorship and surveillance products. Uh, there's an estimated $5 billion in sales of different products like NetSweeper, FinFisher, um, McAfee Smart Filter. And I just want to highlight here that all the products on the slide are made by Western co companies, so companies based in the U.S. and Canada. Actually, NetSweeper was uh, founded just down the highway from where I did my Ph.D. Uh, in Ontario, Canada. Okay, so, you know, what are we doing about it, right? We have these politically motivated actors. They're willing to invest, invest a lot of time and energy in, you know, targeting people, controlling access to information. So what we do in my group at Stony Brook is we take a collaborative approach. We work with political scientists at the Citizen Lab, and we work with them to understand the different policy issues that are happening in the field, and then we design new network measurement techniques to help us understand these policy issues in practice. So, you know, they might have a report of a filtering product being used in a given country, and we'll design a new network measurement that allows us to dig down and see actually what's going on. Today I'm going to be talking about two projects that I've done in collaboration with the Citizen Lab. The first is a longitudinal study of targeted threats. So here we were looking at, you know, what sort of spam and malware is coming at different civil society organizations. So the this study basically highlights you know, the social engineering and time that these adversaries are willing to put in. And then in the second, we're going to talk about fingerprinting devices used for censorship. So when you think about researching internet censorship, you might think, is a website blocked or not? But we're interested in more than just, is it blocked or not? We want to know, how is it blocked? And we want to be able to say, you know, what product was used to do the blocking. And then finally, I'm going to talk a bit about our ongoing work on IC Lab. So actually building a platform that allows us to do these studies at scale. Okay, so diving into our first study. Um, if you're curious about the paper, this was in Usenix Security uh, 2014. You can find it on my site. Um, so the targeted threat study was a four-year study initiated by the Citizen Lab. They had uh, 10 civil society organizations sign on and basically forward suspicious emails to a server at the Citizen Lab. So Citizen Lab basically got this collection of suspicious emails from these civil society organizations. And one thing to note with these groups is they don't, they're not necessarily the most technically savvy folks. You know, they have limited resources, they can't afford to have a sysadmin. Some of them don't even have an office, it's just a group of people with laptops who organize different events and activities. And 
So we were trying to understand, you know, what sort of malware are they facing and how can we help them protect against it. We do a combined analysis of the technical data, so what malware is attached to the email, how technically sophisticated is it, as well as looking at, you know, how much social engineering is there in the email message. One thing to note here is that since these email messages are user submitted, we can't really say something like there's more threats over time because users might forget to submit, they might become less engaged. But we can sort of see, you know, trends in terms of how sophisticated is it. Yeah? Uh, so I can't give their names because they're anonymized, but yeah, you can think about these as being groups that work on, say, uh, Tibetan human rights. Uh, yeah, so they might work. No, so these tend to be like small advocacy groups. So they might work on Tibetan rights issues. They might work on uh, China human rights issues, things like this. Okay, and uh, just to sort of highlight the network environment we're dealing with here, uh, this is a picture one of the citizen lab guys took when he was in Dharmasala. So this is a box with a switch, and a bird has actually made its home in this box. So this sort of shows you know the challenge of trying to deploy, you know, protections in these sort of environments. This is a challenging networking space. Okay, so to summarize the data, we had these 10 groups. So five work on Tibetan human rights, uh, three on China, and two that sort of work on international human rights issues. And the graph here shows the number of submissions over time for groups that submitted at least 50 messages. And here you can sort of see that point I mentioned earlier where you know, engagement sort of varies. So we have China group three, you know, they submit, and then activity sort of levels off. Maybe they forget. They become less engaged. Um, the Tibetan groups were very consistent in terms of submitting messages. So Citizen Lab works very closely with them and keeps in good contact. And so we have a lot of messages uh, from the three Tibetan groups. Okay, so this is sort of the makeup of our data set. And a natural question we had here is, yeah? So on to your sample for this event. So I'm assuming you your sample for this event, you don't just get like a random Right. So it's, it's not a random sample of all of the user's email. It's the user sees this message. They're like, this looks kind of funny. And then they would forward it along to Citizen Lab. Yeah. Okay. So we had you know, this database of email messages and malware. And we want to understand you know, how well are the people and organizations being targeted? So how well is the social engineering on these messages? We also want to understand how technically advanced is the malware. Is this the latest and greatest? Is this run of the mill? You know, how technically advanced are these actors? So in order to uh, look at these different aspects, we come up with what we call the targeted threat index. And the idea is to combine quantifying the social engineering with the technical sophistication. So we basically have what we call uh, social engineering uh, sophistication value, multiply it by the technical sophistication, and we get this index that we call the targeted threat index. It's sort of based on this uh, common vulnerability scoring system, which is a standard malware rating system that one of our collaborators was very uh, familiar with. So, you know, we've got these two values. How are we going to compute them? Well, the first is a social engineering base value. So it ranges from zero to five. You know, zero would be your fake Rolex ad that comes. It's not targeted at all. And five is, is highly personalized. It might have data that's specific to these organizations, things that only their close collaborators would know. And so you might be wondering, well, how do we go from an email to one of these scores, right? Email to zero to five. We basically use a social science technique called content coding. I guess maybe there's some social scientists in the room who are more familiar with this than my usual audience. Um, and basically, two people from the Citizen Lab code each message into one of these categories. And they check to make sure that they're coding this consistently. And they have sort of a criteria of how you go from this email to a one, a two, three, and so on. Uh, so they did the two reviewers to make sure the coding was consistent. They also coded them into themes. So if it's based around a certain country or ethnic group. Okay, so let's see some examples. Um, the first one here, this, is, this would get a score of one. So here we've got, you know, it's not your Rolex ad. Um, but it's not necessarily well customized, right? The sender, World FDC, the group was like, what is this? This is not something we know. Just says, please reply. There's no real message. 
just trying to get people to open the attachment. So we go up to score two. Things get a bit more interesting. So you know, the name is still unknown, Saran Nima. They're like, who is this? Um, but you know, we actually have a subject line you know, related to Tibet, talking about a monk uh, immolation. It's got attachments and trying to get people to actually open them. You know, and as we go up these scores, it gets more sophisticated, right? So here, now it's actually spoofing being from a legitimate sender. So this uh, Paldin Sangpo fellow is actually a real person. Here, you know, it's actually written a whole message. It's copied the signature from this guy's email. And so now this is a very carefully crafted message, right? I mean, this is not, you know, your fly-by-night spammer. Um, you know, similarly for score of four, so now, again, it's spoofing being a person. It's got sort of a friendly greeting. It says, you know, Happy Tib Losar, which is uh, Happy New Year. And again, you know, trying to get them to open an Excel file or a Word document. Um, the, mo the highest score, so there was a few emails that got this score of five, and I actually can't even show it um, because I can't really anonymize it. Um, and this happened with China Group 3, where they got an email pretending to be from a funder, and the email actually referred to a meeting that was happening the following week. And basically, only the group and the funder would have known about this. And so, you know, possibly, you know, this actor is like installed something on their computer. It's able to access data that normal people wouldn't be able to access. Yeah? Why, why did they send this email to you? Why did they think it was suspicious? So, I believe they had a call with the funder and um, sort of realized that the funder hadn't actually sent this message. Um, but yeah, I mean, so another thing too is this sort of message is probably really underrepresented in our sample because if they don't spot it, we're not going to see it. Um, one of the things that they're working on is actually putting network intrusion detection in these networks so that we could actually watch the network traffic and see if we're missing malware. Um, so that would give us sort of a more complete view, but that's still in progress. Okay. So these are the five values. Well, you know, punchline here, how sophisticated are these emails? And we can see that um, you know, some of these groups are quite well targeted. So the Tibetan groups, we see a lot of scores of around three. So they're actually faking being from a legitimate sender. They're having you know, appropriate content in them. Oops. Um, but I mean, we also see strange things like this, where China group one has a spike in this targeted value, targeting value of one. Um, part of the reason for this was China group one actually just hooked their spam filter to send messages. So some of their messages were the targeted stuff that we wanted. Uh, the other stuff was from their spam filter, so that was a bit less relevant for us. So you know, most of the actual stuff tends to be around this score of three. Okay. So you know, we've got our social engineering value. We also want to rate how technically sophisticated the malware is. So this value ranges from one to two. And the focus here isn't really on the functionality of the malware. All this stuff basically does the same thing. They're remote access tools. You know, they get on your machine, they look at the data. It's all basically the same function. And how they differentiate themselves is really how well they hide once they're on these machines. And you know, the reason this is so important is it allows them to stay hidden longer. They can get more data. Okay, so we have these score, um, how we go from a piece of malware to one of these scores. It's sort of a combination of analysis, uh, file analysis, so actually looking at the binary and figuring out what sort of packing method is used. Uh, static analysis, so using some standard tools to analyze the code and figure out you know, how is it trying to hide itself. Also dynamic analysis, so put the malware on a virtual machine and you know, look at the network traffic and see sort of what it's doing. Okay, so that's our technical sophistication multiplier. And the interesting thing here, right, so if you remember that value goes from one to two, but you know, the, the highest technical sophistication we saw was actually only 1.5. So, you know, this is really not the latest and greatest in terms of packing technology. And, you know, so the moral of the story, the technical sophistication is not that high. Um, and, you know, Citizen Lab has seen malware with higher technical sophistication values, but it's not really what's being used in these emails. They're sort of just sending, you know, run-of-the-mill malware here. So. You know, now we want to combine these scores and look at uh, this you know, targeted threat index. And what this score helps us do is highlight the important threats. So if we just look at the malware that has the highest technical sophistication, so we see 
you know, d different families of malware. Um, if you don't spend your life looking at malware, that's cool. These are basically, you know, run-of-the-mill, standard things you would find on, you know, someone's Windows machine. This is not necessarily your politically motivated actor. Or a Mac, whatever, equal opportunity. <laughs> but if we look at the malware that's getting the maximum targeted threat index score, we start to see interesting things. So, you know, we see this ghost rat, uh, Lurk Zero, ShadowNet, and these are viruses that were found on, you know, the Tibetan government in exile's machines by the Citizen Lab. And the moral of the story here is that, I mean, this technical sophistication value is only 1.25. Um, you know, they're not really putting effort into technical sophistication, but the targeting is where they're really spending a lot of their time. They're spending time doing the social engineering and crafting the message so that people will actually click on that link, they'll download the file, and they'll be infected. So, you know, the key takeaway here is that these politically motivated actors are spending more time doing the social engineering of these threats because, you know, you can have the fanciest malware, but if the message doesn't look realistic, the person is not going to download it and it's not going to be effective. This also suggests that, you know, lower cost education initiatives could be useful. So if you train people to identify these sort of social cues and emails, maybe you can help them avoid some of these threats. Um, also, the Tibetan groups have started doing this sort of uh, detach from attachments campaign. So if you go on YouTube, you can search for this campaign and see videos where they, g they walk through different scenarios and tell them, you know, don't click on the link, don't download the file. And, you know, you could imagine if they move to, say, a cloud platform like Google Docs, that might help them because we found that, you know, 95% of the malware we saw was just attachments to these emails. So if we could get them to stop using attachments, that might help uh, with the malware. I mean, obviously, as a security researcher, I see, you know, it's an arms race. The malware people might move to clouds, but, I mean, for now, if they just stop doing, you know, Word document attachments, it would get them pretty far. Okay, so this was, hmm? yeah. So the other 5%, are those basically, like, links to, you know, drive-by download sites, or what is the other 5%? Yeah, basically links to uh, websites with drive-by downloads. Okay. Are there any other questions before I move on? Yeah, feel free to interrupt. This can be really interactive. Um, so that was sort of the key takeaways there. So what we highlighted with this longitudinal study was really the time the adversaries are willing to put in in terms of social engineering these messages. And in the next part of the talk, I'm going to discuss sort of the money side, you know, the adversaries who are willing to spend money and buy a product to control access to information. And here we wanted to actually fingerprint specifically which products are being used for censorship. So, you know, filtering products are a dual-use technology, right? You know, if you have an office, maybe you don't want your employees browsing Facebook. If you're a school, maybe you don't want the school children accessing inappropriate content. But you take this same device and you install it on a national backbone ISP, and suddenly it can be used to, you know, restrict access to information, can restrict free speech, you can do surveillance, censorship. And the dual use of these technologies hasn't gone unnoticed. Um, Obama's actually come out and put sanctions in place saying, you know, you can't ship these products to Syria and Iran. Um, EU and Israel have similar bans in place saying, you know, you shouldn't be shipping these products to countries that are going to use them against their citizens. Okay, well, you know, this is great. There's sanctions in place. But how would we even enforce them? And that's sort of the question we were trying to answer in this study is, you know, how can you actually monitor which products are being used and hopefully enforce sanctions with, you know, evidence and repeatable data? Okay, so here we're designing tools and techniques for identifying installations of these products and actually confirming that they're used for censorship. So, um, yeah, basically our steps, you know, we find the installations, we make sure that they're still active, and then finally we confirm that they're actually doing censorship. So, Finding suspected installations, it can be easy. So, you know, you have a user in Pakistan, they see a NetSweeper logo on the block page, you know, you go home. It's basically NetSweeper being used. But obviously these companies are noticing that they're getting bad PR. No one wants to be known as the person who's filtering the internet in Pakistan. And so they're taking their logos off these pages. So now, you know, how do we know what product is being used here? So other ways we can find uh, products, so if there's no logo, uh, we can look for user reports. If you have technically savvy people in the region, they might post on Twitter saying, you know, this ISP is using NetSweeper. And we can also do scans of publicly accessible IP address space. So if a, net, 
a network operator installs one of these products with a globally routable IP address, and we, you know, we send ping packets and measurements to it, it responds basically as a NetSweeper box would. And so we can scan IP address space and find some of these boxes as well. So this, this is uh, the bulk of what we use in this study. Um, just some examples of user reports. Um, the Citizen Lab guys are pretty good at looking at social media and forums and finding these things. So, you know, someone tweeting that Reliance World is using NetSweeper. Here's a forum post talking about, you know, finding NetSweeper in their network. Um, in terms of scans, so what we used in this study was the Shodan search engine. It basically does scans of publicly accessible IP address space. It finds, you know, things like webcams, uh, routers that are open. Um, it also finds handy things like NetSweeper and Bluecoat boxes. Um, you know, at the time of this study, the internet census data was starting to come out, so someone created a botnet that did a large-scale internet scan. Um, we were kind of, the ethics of using that data is sort of up in the air. Um, and there's also more recent tools like ZMAP that sort of came out um, concurrently to this study. So our focus here was on this Shodan search engine. But the question is, well, we have the Shodan search engine. What should we search for to find NetSweeper? And what we do is we have sort of small-scale hands-on testing. So users will report, you know, a given product is being used in a network. And we can sort of, you know, poke at the interface a little bit, look at, you know, different strings that we see and things we might want to search for in Shodan. So here, you know, they found the NetSweeper policy interface. And we see this webadmin slash deny slash index.php. This is basically the path for your NetSweeper block page. Okay, so, you know, basically the system lab got a hold of a bunch of these and found the different strings. And for these four products, we had the following keywords. Um, main point here, these are intentionally broad. So URL blocked. It's probably going to catch a lot of things, right? Um, but the goal here was really to find as many suspected installations as possible, and then we'll whittle it down after. Okay, so that's our set of terms. And this is an example. So if you put, you know, web admin port 8080 into Shodan, you get, you know, different networks that are running it. So Canadian Department of Education. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about what Shodan does? So I'm not familiar with it. Um, what does it do? Is it actually setting up a TCP connection and setting an HTTP request that does? So. What's, it, what's, it, what's going on? Shodan. It, Shodan that's a good question. Um, it's some sort of scan. I'm not 100% sure on their precise methodology, but it's sort of a scan. They issue some HTTP requests and tests for like, my guess is they probably have a set of different um, probes they would send to a box to figure out like, is this a webcam? Is this a router? So it seems it can set up a TCP connection to the other device and then does a bunch of probing. I would assume, yeah, it's a TCP-based scan. Uh, yeah, so I mean, they have things like you know, they had this 302 response that came back. And um, so this isn't a fresh uh, result, but I mean, one of the things we find here is these results aren't always up to date. So, you know, Shodan might have scanned this a couple months ago. How do we know that the product is still running on the IP address that we've gotten back? Yeah, so not fresh. Um, and how we do this is we use a tool called WhatWeb. This is a simple tool that runs HTTP requests against a given IP address, and it looks for different signatures in the HTTP replies. So, you know, does the server header indicate that this is a given proxy or filtering product? And, you know, lucky for us, they have a signature for NetSweeper. Uh, for the other products, we could sort of see in the URLs if it was answering like blue coat or something like this. Okay, so, we found our set of installations. We run them through this what web tool to make sure they're still active. And this was sort of the output. So these are the four products. And you can see, you know, we find, you know, sort of the usual suspects in the Middle East. You know, we find, you know, NetSweeper, Blue Coat. Yeah. Uh, did you double check that, for example, the webcam has a uh, false positive or false signals? Like the signatures, for example, for uh, the uh, Blue Coat or whatever you want. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, did you double check that, uh, like their signatures actually uh, may lead to false negatives? So I think we probably could have false negatives. So if we somehow don't find one of these products, um, possibly extending this with you know our own scanning tool okay. would help, or getting a hold of some of these boxes and actually profiling their behavior. Oh, uh, so ba basically, we uh, trusted what uh, the 
Dogs. Yeah, so I mean, from the showdown results, we get like, we get this candidate superset. We, you know, not necessarily all running the products. And then we use sort of what web to whittle it down to things that are actually running, say, NetSweeper or Blue Coat. Do we have any clue, like, or it's an unknown developer? Uh, I haven't looked at the website in a while. I didn't actually, yeah, probably you can Google it. Yeah. I was curious about your map. Like, mm -hmm. um, so for example, I'm wondering about the dots in the US and things. That, do you know what organization, I mean, maybe you're coming to this. But some of these might be public libraries yep, and things yep. like that. OK. Yeah, exactly. So you know, we have the usual suspects in the mil Middle East. We have also Australia. Canada, the US, and this sort of comes back to the point that these are dual use products. I mean, to back up a few more slides even, you know, this is the Canadian Department of Education. It's probably related to schools. If you look at China, there's nothing there. It shows how. Yeah, there's like one smart filter, which I think ended up being in a school or something because China implements their own censorship. Centralized. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of the comparative strength and so weaknesses of these? program, so like what makes NetSweeper attractive for Iran but not for some other country? So, you know, they, they offer sort of different functionality. Um, a lot of them give you some sort of uh, website filtering tool where they say we have, you know, X million URLs classified, so that would be one selling feature. Bluecoat gives you a proxy piece of hardware that you can put in your network. Um, you know, obviously they could compete on price. It's sort of a standard, you know, business. They have slightly different offerings. Is there any way to, to, to then map those characteristics to where they're used and like make some inferences about what countries prefer what kind of, you know, what kind of country? That's a good question. Um, I mean, we haven't really looked so much into that. It's sort of an interesting question about you know what, what considerations are important for these sensors. And this is something we come up against a lot in our work, which is, you know, what sort of behavior do we assume from these sensors? Like, what is the sensor willing to do? What are they not willing to do? Um, so it might be interesting to see, like, if there are uh, different features of these products that might make them more attractive in certain areas. Yeah. Do you know if you or anyone looked at IPv6 and whether or not, you know, something gets a block page through one of these boxes on IPv4, but IPv6 gets through? I mean, there's sort of rumors about that. Yeah, uh, we haven't looked into that, but I've also heard those rumors. Yeah, that'd be interesting. IPv6 is just the new circumvention technology. Even doing the scan is really obviously very difficult. Yeah. 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 I mean, also, I mean, here we're sort of relying on you know network administrators not doing the best job and in installing these on publicly routable IP addresses. <laughs> so ideally, we would you know eventually design techniques that don't rely on that. Yeah. Um, this is sort of you know a first cut to get some data about this. Yeah, so I mean, Nick called out the good point here, which is these are dual use. This isn't all being used for censorship. And so we wanted to actually confirm, you know, is this box being used on the national ISP to do censorship? So how can we do this? Well, you know, we get a tester in the country. They try to access a blocked site. If we're lucky, hey, there's a smart filter logo. We go home. But, you know, as we've seen, these block pages are getting more stealthy. They're not putting logos on the page. They're not putting the product name in the server header for HTTP. And so in this case, how can we pinpoint what product's being used? So what we did in this paper is sort of a cute idea, is we leveraged the fact that these URL lists are really you know, the key selling point for these products. They want to advertise that they have millions of URLs classified. And one of the things they do is they actually accept user submissions for websites. So they let you submit websites that maybe should be blocked. So what do we do? Well, we create a set of 10 domains. So these are domains that haven't been used before. Uh, we put the Glipe proxy script on them, so now they're hosting a proxy. And we take, so first we check that they're not blocked. So we create some sites, make sure they're accessible. We take half of them and submit them to whatever product we're testing. And we check again, so we have the submitted ones, the ones we didn't submit. And you know, if a given product is being used, we would expect that the sites we submitted would be blocked and the sites we didn't would still be accessible. So that's the basic idea. We were able to use this to confirm different products being used. Um, so the red lines here are cases where we actually couldn't confirm. So yeah. where did you submit it from? Did you submit it from like Silicon Lab or US or somebody from like uh, 
I mean, I, I want to know whether the IP of whoever submitted the black uh, the list of URL is, mm -hmm. um, for example, you were uh, MRL tour. Yeah, I think it was a fellow in Seattle, our collaborator there. So um, yeah, and I mean, so I mean, this solution sort of works now, but it's not really future proof, right? So this gives us some idea of what networks are running these. You could imagine doing more profiling and building sort of generic fingerprinting tools that don't rely on some of these features. Yeah, because I mean, they could just say, hey, this is Citizen Lab submitting the site. Never mind. Um, yeah, so you know, here we submitted you know, three sites. They weren't blocked. In the other cases, you know, we submit five sites, and they do end up being blocked. So we're able to confirm you know, McAfee Smart Filter in Saudi Arabia, UAE, NetSweeper in Qatar, Yemen, and also UAE. And so, you know, we have these confirmed uh, installations. And we want to know, well, what are they being used to censor? So we had clients in these countries run through Citizen Lab's test list. And Citizen Lab's URL lists have different categories. So, you know, things like media freedom, human rights, uh, religious criticism. And here we're seeing, you know, smart filter and net super being used to block a lot of these. In Yemen, we see sort of a bit less, but we're still seeing, you know, media freedom, LGBT and minority groups and religions being blocked. And a lot of these categories of speech are actually protected under the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Um, so this is stuff that the UN believes people should be able to access, but these products are being used to stop that. Okay. So um, are there any questions before I move on to the challenges? Yeah? Instead of blocking sites, they were just tracking to see who went to sites or adding some things on to mm -hmm. give cookies or whatever to people who went to the sites. So we didn't see that in this study. Um, when I was looking at Korean data with the Citizen Lab, we saw an interesting thing where um, basically pirated software sites were getting a DNS response for 127.0.0.1, so basically looping the user back to their machine. But if they tried to access North Korean sites, they were getting redirected to like one IP address in this one Korean ISP. So in that case, you could probably hypothesize that they want to be tracking the people that are trying to access that sort of content. Um, but we didn't really see that in this case. Okay, so you know, I presented this sort of cute solution, made it sound quite easy, um, not as easy as it sounds. Well, you know, we need to rely on knowing what content is going to be filtered in this country. So I said we put this proxy script on, we submit the proxy sites. Well, what if the network you want to test isn't blocking proxies? So we had this sort of awkward situation where you know, a network is blocking pornography. We had to, <laughs> uh, basically, someone did a Google image search and pulled the first flesh tone photo and yeah, <laughs> very quickly took it down. Um, you know, and vendors could change their approach. They might not accept submissions. Um, also, inconsistent blocking, right? You think of censorship as on or off. And, you know, we saw things where the censor would sort of be offline for some period. So in Yemen, they have a limited number of NetSweeper licenses. When too many people are online, then the next users to come online won't be filtered. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was this funny situation where, like, you had to test multiple times to make sure, like, is it really not censored? Um, one of the things we saw as well was, once you tried to access a site in a country, sometimes they would add it to their list anyways. So that initial test to see if the things were accessible was causing them to be added to the list, and the whole thing ends up being blocked. Also, we saw combinations. So we saw a network that had a blue coat box in it, but was actually using Smart Filters URL uh, lists. So they can sort of you know, run these things in pairs. And also coordinating with users and scheduling tests. You know, it's right before the paper deadline. You're calling the guy in Saudi Arabia who's talking to his friend in Qatar, who's hitting en enter on his Python program, and you're really hoping the data comes back, um, but not necessarily. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a lot of manual effort here, a lot of coordination. It's not really sustainable to be running this repeatedly over time if you always need to call your friend and get them to run the program. Okay, so that brings me to sort of the ongoing work I'm doing with IC Lab, and we're trying to address some of these challenges. You know, we want a way of measuring online information controls that makes it easy for people that are in these countries that want to help us out uh, run, you know, different sorts of experiments. We wanted to enable repeatable measurements, so measurements that run every day for a long period of time. We want to make specifying and scheduling experiments easy. So a lot of the system lab's work is test these URLs in this country. You know, that's a pretty simple command to support. 
also facilitating a variety of tests. So there's a lot of really neat network measurement uh, work going on right now in censorship. So different tests we can do to figure out where web proxies are in the network, to figure out if there's a transparent proxy on our path. And we want to be able to support people to s specify you know, very nuanced network measurements on this platform. So it's not just, is this accessible or not? It's actually some very specialized network measurements to figure out how is it blocked, where is it being blocked. And the final point here is we wanted to make this automatable. Um, when I went to the Citizen Lab and you know, first chatted with them, they told me sort of their way of detecting censorship is this fellow looks at the web page that came back in Toronto and the web page that came back in the Middle East and says, was it blocked or not? Uh, so one of the things we wanted to have in IC Lab was sort of automated uh, censorship detection. So can we automatically detect block pages, automatically detect injected resets, and all this sort of thing. So just the overview here, basically have clients in the field, uh, Raspberry Pis, um, Android will come at some point. Um, and so we have the control server, so it sends experiments as well as relevant data, so maybe the list of URLs to test to these clients. The clients run the measurement and they send the results back. Uh, the client here is designed to be very, um, fairly basic in terms of just doing the measurements and the data comes back and the analysis is going to happen sort of on the server side. So if you come up with a new block, you know, block page detection technique, you still have the data here and you can run your technique on the data that's uh, on your server. So you know, the results come back, goes into a database. We have our analysis code that runs you know, block page detection, the device fingerprinting. And then the output here is you know, web pages, advocacy, blog posts. Uh, I'm a junior faculty, so hopefully papers too. Um, <laughs> and in terms of progress, so the client and server in sort of a limited beta, We've got about 10 volunteers running these right now. Uh, we have hundreds of VPN endpoints. So we can use VPN services to test in regions where it's not necessarily safe to have a person running the measurements. Um, we also have our block page detection algorithm. So this was done with Nick and Ben. It was at IMC last year, where we actually created a technique that can automatically identify if a web page is blocked or not. And uh, just some images. So here's the map uh, with the VPN endpoints. And um, my student was excited, so he made a little stack of the Raspberry Pis. So basically, these are the d devices that we're handing out to people. And you know, these are volunteers that want to help us measure censorship anyways, so this just makes it easier for them to help with our work. Okay, so uh, with that, I'll wrap up. Uh, you know, a lot of collaboration here. So my group at Stony Brook, a big group of people at Citizen Lab, as well as uh, Nick here at Princeton and some of his students at Georgia Tech, too. Thanks.